Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. On to chapter 10 now, sustaining terrestrial biodiversity. We're going to learn about how do we sustain the biodiversity here on land. And we're going to talk about uh, in more detail forest, public lands, grasslands, wetlands, and cities in this lecture. Now, I will say for better or for worse, again, if you like uh, hearing me talk, you're going to enjoy this. Uh, if you don't like hearing me talk, you may not enjoy this. But uh, unfortunately, or again, fortunately, depending on how you see things, uh, there are 90 slides to this uh, lesson here, this chapter. So I'm going to be breaking this chapter uh, down into three lecture parts, all right? Instead of the two, there'll be three, each about 30 slides, each approximately uh, 20 minutes. So a little bit longer uh, than what we've experienced so far, but there's a lot we got to learn about sustaining terrestrial biodiversity, all right? So let's get right to it. Uh, first, we talk about our first core case study, which is Costa Rica, a global conservation leader. Uh, I've never been to Costa Rica. I wonder if you, any of you have. My parents have actually been there twice. They love it so much. And I'm hoping it's definitely on my bucket list a uh, place to head down the road. So Costa Rica was once covered in tropical forests, but between 1963 and 1983, they suffered widespread deforestation. And so they realized that they needed to restore their forests. So uh, because Costa Rica still harbors great biodiversity, and they also have a lot of microclimates. Uh, if you know Costa Rica, it lies on on that, uh, uh, on that, uh, uh, in, in Central America, Pacific Ocean on one side, Gulf of Mexico on the other, and a high mountain range in between. So it doesn't allow the Pacific climate to mix with the Gulf of Mexico climate. And then, of course, you have some sort of mountainous climate uh, in the mountains in the middle. So a lot of microclimates providing a variety of habitats. More than 25% of Costa Rica's land is now nature reserves and national parks. The government knew they had to do that uh, because of the widespread deforestation in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, and what does the government do? They pay landowners to restore forests. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the uh, some of the things that the governments uh, can do to help sustain forests uh, as we go through this lecture. So here is uh, this is La Fortuna Falls in the Areno Volcano National Park uh, in Costa Rica. Again, absolutely beautiful and definitely uh, definitely on my bucket list. At, at some point. All right, so how should we manage and sustain forest and public lands? Forest ecosystems, ecosystems provide ecosystem services that are far greater in value than the value of any wood or timber or any raw materials that we can get out of the forest. And that's something that we've been talking about throughout this course and something that we will continue to talk about uh, as we go through uh, 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 the, next, uh, the, the, the next chapters is that we're not calculating the ecosystem services that our planet provides us, we're not calculating that in a, in a money way. We need to calculate how much money, okay, put a value on these ecosystem services so that then you can compare that value to the materials that we're taking out of the earth or, or, or from the earth. And if you compare those values, you're going to realize that the ecosystem services far outweigh any value uh, of those resources that we're taking from, from the planet. And this is something that we have, this is where education comes into play. We have to start educating people that this is the case. And, and we do that by trying to compare this, all right? So forests can be preserved by halting government subsidies that hasten their destruction, by protecting old growth forests. We'll talk about what they are in a bit. And sustainably harvesting trees. We'll also talk about that uh, in, in just a couple of minutes as well. So this is putting a price on nature's ecosystem services. These are the values, the estimated values of Earth's ecosystem services. So you'll notice waste treatment, all right? We talked about, for instance, how wetlands, right? Uh, wetlands that help, help to purify, purify water, all right? Well, that over $22 trillion per year. Recreation, over $20 trillion. Erosion control, right? We talked about how trees, uh, we did that core case study a couple of chapters ago about how trees along a river, when they were, when the trees were, were wiped out, uh, more erosion sediment went into the river. Well, we don't talk about the fact that trees, you could put a money on that erosion control, a monetary value. There it is, $16 trillion a year. Food production, $14 trillion a year. Nutrient cycling, all right? Just we talked about with the, with the, with the bacteria Bacteria, all right, in the soil. Uh, again, you don't put, you usually don't think about putting a, a, a monetary value to that. It's over 11 trillion per year. Okay, so again, if you start putting these monetary values uh, to the uh, e ecosystem services the planet provides us, uh, then you can compare it with the actual money you're making from taking the Earth's resources, and you'll realize 
these values are much higher okay, than the actual money values that we're getting from the resources. Since 1997, the world has been losing ecosystem services valued at 20 trillion per year. So we're degrading our environment and we're losing these ecosystem services at a value of over 20 trillion a year. All right, ongoing source of ecological income, if used sustainably, okay, and we need to use full cost pricing, which we've talked about in previous chapters, to include the value of the ecosystem services in prices of forest goods and services. So the point is, if you sell that timber, okay, you have to not only factor in the amount of money it takes to harvest the timber and to transport the timber and to have the, uh, the, the big heads of the companies making their salaries, you also need to factor in the ecosystem service that that tree that you're trying to sell provided, okay, because if you factor in that money, well, then the price of that timber is going to go up and that may, or at least hopefully, the idea is that then that curbs the amount, uh, the amount of timber that people are using, or at least that's uh, that's the idea by using this full cost pricing uh, idea. So again. Um, here is just a, just a picture of that, basically what we're looking at here. Uh, there used to be a tropical forest here. Uh, it was clear cut and you have planted uh, the same types of trees. These are palm trees to create palm oil. All right, this actually kills biodiversity because you only have one tree now in this entire area that used to be a tropical rainforest. Okay, and the point is, uh, you know, while you're going to make money from these palm oil trees, obviously that's the reason that, that the, the, the rainforest was cut down and these uh, palm oil trees were put in, uh, the amount of money that it takes. And if you look at this, it takes what? It takes close to 25 years to actually get the palm or the trees to a point where you can use the palm oil. Uh, the money that the ecosystem services would have provided from that tropical rainforest far outweighs the money that whoever did this is going to make on the palm oil. And again, that's the point, putting a price on nature's ecosystem services, uh, that palm oil's price should be increased so that it factors in uh, the ecological or the money lost of the ecological services that the former tropical rainforest that used to be here uh, actually provided. All right. So that's kind of what we're talking about with this full, uh, uh, full cost pricing. All right, so forests provide important economic and ecosystem services. Again, we're just continuing to talk about this. So what other type of e economic and ecosystem services do the forests provide that, again, we can put a monetary value on? Well, forests help remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, right? Help stabilize temperature. We did that with our lab outside. We talked about a carbon sequestration a, a couple of units ago. All right, forests store water and release it slowly. All right, very important. Forests provide habitats for two thirds of the world's terrestrial species. So over 66% of the world's terrestrial species, they need forests, that's where they live. Forests also provide biofuel, industrial wood, and traditional medicine. So again, just some more natural capital on the left here, ecosystem services that the forests uh, 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 supply us. On the right, economic services, so ecosystem, Support energy flow, chemical cycling, reduce soil erosion, absorb and release water, purify water and air, influence local and regional climate, store that atmosphere carbon, provide numerous wildlife habitats. Again, things that we all need and we've discussed. Economic-wise, fuel wood, lumber, pulp to make paper, mining, livestock, grazing, recreation, and jobs. All right, so let's talk more about forests now. Forests are going to vary in age and structure. So we have basically uh, three types of forests here. First known as the old growth or primary forest. And these forests are going to be uncut or undisturbed for over 200 years or more, and they are reservoirs of biodiversity. So where do we have some old growth forests? The redwoods, okay, out in California are an old growth forest. Uh, in Russia, Siberia, uh, they have old growth forests there as well. These forests haven't been touched for hundreds and hundreds of years. All right, basically uh, reservoirs of biodiversity. Then we have not something known as second growth forest. These are trees that grow from secondary ecological succession. So maybe you have a forest fire that wipes out a forest and then a new forest grows, uh, you know, maybe it takes 100 years or so for a new forest to grow. That would be a second growth forest. And then we have tree plantations. That's the picture I just showed you of those, uh, of those palm trees to create palm oil. Uh, these are tree farms or commercial forests. Uh, basically the 
same age trees are clear cut and then replanted to supply industrial wood. So they plant trees, they grow at the same age, they're clear cut, they plant more, they grow at the same, uh, same age, you know, same rate, same age, and then they're cut, all right? And those are your tree plantations. So uh, this is a picture of actually an old growth forest in Poland, all right? So they, we do have them uh, all over the world. And again, all this means is that this forest has been undisturbed for hundreds and hundreds of years. All right, so there are, there are many ways to harvest trees, all right? These are your three ways to harvest trees, all right? The first step when you harvest trees is you have to build logging roads, and this begins your degradation of the forest because when you build a logging road, think about it, you got a forest, and then you cut a road through it, well, now you're already beginning to fragment that forest. So that habitat now is already starting to fragment. All right, we have something known as selective cutting. This is when intermediate age or mature trees are cut singly or in small groups. We have something called clear cutting, which is basically removing all the trees in an area. And then we have something called strip cutting, which is basically clear cutting in strips. So uh, let me show you some pictures of what this looks like. Well, actually, first off, uh, this is basically what we just talked about. Here's your old growth forest. Your new highway comes in here, all right, to basically get to these trees to harvest them. And already you are beginning to fragment your, your habitat, your forest. And then look what happens here eventually. You got a highway. You basically clear plots for grazing and agriculture. You still have some forest around, but now these forests are fragmented to one another. So if you had a, a, a species that needed a large range, right, to live, all right, needed a big forest. Now you have too little forest, okay? This, of course, disrupts the forest, disrupts the ecosystem uh, and, and the ecological services, and uh, your forest is, is degraded, all right? So here are here's the picture of what we're talking about with the different types of ways to cut trees. So the first up here is selective cutting, where, again, you just pick out, okay, uh, intermediate age or mature trees and you cut them here and there. Here's your clear cutting. You just cut everything down. And then this is the strip cutting, basically where you clear cut in strips. So uh, the question is, which is the best way to harvest trees? Uh, selective cutting is obviously the best because in selective cutting, uh, you're, you're, you're selecting certain trees to cut. Okay. You don't want to cut them all, all right, strip cutting here. This is terrible clear cutting. You could obviously see it. it's horrible. All right, strip cutting a little better, but still you're leaving strips of this of this ha of this forest fragmented. So the forest now, the hab habitat here is fragmented. Here, you may be thinning the, 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 the forest a little bit, but you're not fragmenting it. And as a result, you can still, uh, 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 still the biodiversity is still maintained. The eco uh, ecological services are still maintained uh, in a forest like like this when you do selective cutting, all right? But those are the three ways uh, in which uh, people harvest trees. All right, we then talk about fires and how they affect forest ecosystems. Uh, a couple of types of fires to learn about. The first is called a surface fire, all right? It's just what it sounds like. It's on the surface, usually burns leaf litter and undergrowth uh, and provides several ecological benefits. So actually surface fires aren't uh, horrible when it comes to uh, when it comes to the ecosystem uh, of a particular area because what it does is it, kill, it it clears out a lot of dead dead undergrowth a lot of dead leaf litter and actually provides soil more nutrient soil for other plants and other other trees and other uh, 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 um, animals and stuff to kind of use so uh, they're definitely not not horrible surface fires now crown fires are extremely hot and they burn whole trees. They kill wildlife and they increase topsoil erosion. So crown fires we don't want, all right? Surface fires are okay. Some surface fires here or there actually provide us with some benefits. Crown fires do not, okay? Again, they burn everything in sight. They kill wildlife, all right? And they actually increase the topsoil erosion. And the climate change is lengthening the fire seasons because it not only is it hotter, but in places it is getting drier. Uh, so hotter and drier equals uh, a longer fire season season. So a couple of pictures of these types of fires on the left, obviously a surface fire, all right, uh, just kind of burning that under undergrowth, that dead, uh, that, that dead leaf litter on the ground, uh, and then providing, uh, as long as the forest doesn't burn down, it actually helps out the forest, uh, actually helps to grow new trees and, and, and new plants and things like that. On your right is your crown fire, okay, where the entire forest is engulfed in flame, uh, and obviously uh, we don't want that. So 
You may have heard about in California how they talk about lighting a fire near your home during the beginning of the fire season to actually burn away all the underbrush and all the dead leaf litter. Because if you do that, then if you happen to get a situation where a big crown fire erupts, well, it's not going to have as much fuel to continue. Because again, if it doesn't have that undergrowth, that dead litter, leaf litter to burn, uh, the crown fires have a hard time getting to the stage you see on the right here. So actually surface fires that actually in parts of California, they actually uh, talk about having individual people in their homes actually set some surface fires uh, at the beginning of the fire season to get rid of all that dead uh, uh, leaf leaf litter, dead brushed, anything that's that's d dead, that's dry, all right, that could be lead to fuel uh, for a potential crown fire, okay? So again, you got your surface fires and your crown fires. All right, <clears throat> almost half of the world's forests have been cut down. Obviously, we call that deforestation, temporary or permanent renew removal of large expanses of forest for agricultural sediments or other uses. We call deforestation. Tropical forests have been uh, have been decimated, especially in Latin America, Indonesia, and Africa, and the and the boreal forests. All right, uh, especially in Alaska, Canada, Scandinavia, and Russia uh, have also been devastated. So, uh, what kind of degradation are we getting from deforestation? Well, water pollution and soil degradation from erosion. All right, acceleration of flooding, uh, local extinction of specialist species, all right, that might live in these forests, habitat loss for native and migrating species, and obviously a release of carbon dioxide and a loss of carbon dioxide absorption. When you cut down forests and burn them, you're releasing carbon dioxide into the air, but now you got less trees to uh, sequester that carbon dioxide. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, there's that... Uh, uh, there's that cycle that we that 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 we don't want. Okay, all right. So uh, again, just a picture of what happens here. Uh, you can see the erosion. All right, the soil moving away because we don't have any any trees. The roots, all right, of trees, grasses hold in soil. You, that stuff goes away, and the soil goes away as well. All right, so another case study managing public lands in the U.S. Forests of the eastern U.S. were decimated between 1620 and 1920, uh, grown back naturally through secondary ecological succession. Okay, remember secondary soil is left over. Large areas of old growth and second growth forests cut down and replaced with biologically simplified tree plantations. Again, one tree. One type of tree is biologically simplified. You do not get a lot of biodiversity uh, and a growing threat. Obviously, hardwood forests cleared to produce wood pellets for export. Again, this is, uh, this is our threat, okay, when it comes to these forests. So this picture here pretty much tells it all. Here was 1620. Look at all the forests, especially along the eastern coast here. Uh, basically, the Mississippi River, east of the Mississippi River was all forest, guys, uh, back in the 1600s. By the 1920s, Yikes. What happened to the green? Okay. You don't see much of it. All right. And now here in 2000, some of it uh, is, oh, some of it is beginning to come back uh, across the Eastern coast here or uh, the Eastern seaboard. But again, nothing like it was back uh, in the 1600s before, uh, before Europeans got here. All right. So you can kind of see uh, what's going on here and why these forests are disappearing rapidly in the U.S. But not only U.S. forests, again, those tropical forests are disappearing rapidly. Majority of the loss of the tropical forests have been since 1950, all right? So really only in the last 70 years or so. And again, Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, uh, clearing trees accelerates climate change. So this is part of that uh, positive feedback loop we talk about that we don't want. All right, Indonesia leads the world in tropical deforestation. And again, destroying rainforests to produce that palm oil that I showed you. All right, you might think it's okay. Hey, look, we get rid of forests, but at least we're planting all these palm trees. No, having one type of, uh, of plant or tree in an area destroys your biodiversity because think about it, tropical rainforests have countless numbers, different types of trees and, and shrubs and plants, okay? So even if you cut it, scrape that down and put in all palm trees, it still does not help uh, in your biodiversity. So what are the causes of these tropical forests disappearing? And again, guys, a lot of this stuff is common sense. We've been talking about it throughout the course, population growth, all right? Need places for people to live, 
pov uh, poverty of subsistence farmers. Okay, they they need these. Uh, they need some land to be able to, uh, to 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 try to grow crops and to make some money. Ranching, all right, uh, need something for cattle, right? Need clear land for cattle to graze. Lumber, all right, there's that plantation farms, the palm oil we talked about, and obviously global trade as well, all right? So all causes uh, that these those tropical rainforests are disappearing. So how can we manage and sustain forests? That's the big question, uh, and that's the answer we need to find out over the next 50 to 100 years or we're going to be in big trouble. So here are some methods to sustain forests. Again, we talked about the first one. Emphasize the value of their ecosystem services. Okay. Show people, allow people, compare and contrast. Okay. You know, this, this, this tree costs, you know, again, I'm just making this up 20, 20 bucks. All right. For it, for it, for some lumber. All right. But you need to factor in how much that tree that tree's value was to stop erosion or to sequester carbon. So if you factor in that, well, guess what? That tree may actually be worth $40, okay, and not 20. And that's what we need to do to try to show people and educate people that when you take that tree, you're not only, it's not only costing 20, it's costing 40 because of all these other ecosystem services that the tree used to provide uh, for the earth. Halt government subsidies that hasten forest destruction, all right? We have subsidies out there that help uh, that help uh, 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 help different types of industry get in there and clear cut forests to produce things to to to, to uh, make money. Uh, we don't want to do that anymore. All right. If anything, we want to do the opposite like they did in Costa Rica, uh, pay people to return forests to their land. That's what that's what we should be doing. We have to protect those old growth forests, okay? Because just like the tropical rainforests are in the tropics, the old growth forests are your biodiversity harbingers uh, in the northern latitudes, okay? So we wanna we wanna protect those forests. Harvest trees no faster than they are replenished, all right? That's why that selective cutting kind of works well, all right? Because we're harvesting trees here and there, all right? We're not cutting down an entire strip of trees and then waiting 30 years for them to uh, grow back. Plant trees to reestablish forest. Again, that's what we talk about. Maybe pay people to actually create forest on their land instead of destroying the forest uh, on, on their land. Uh, widely used approaches, all right, maximum sustainable yield. Harvest the maximum amount of trees that will not reduce future yield, okay? So that's kind of like what that selective cutting has talked about. Uh, basically, you harvest the max amount that you can get that doesn't affect future, all right? Because you don't want to clear cut everything and then for the next 30 years, you get nothing, all right? You want to be able to take a little this year, take a little next year, take a little the year after. Ecosystem-based management, minimize harmful uh, harvesting impacts on the ecosystem, obviously, all right? And adaptive management, harvest forest, evaluate results and modify your approach, okay? Adapt, all right? If you har harvest a forest, you realize you maybe cut too many trees down. Well, evaluate what you did and then modify. Uh, and the next time, uh, don't do it in the same way. Uh, here are more solutions, more sustainable forestry, all right? Include ecosystem services of forest in estimates of their ec economic value. We talked about that already. Identify and protect highly diverse forest areas, the old growth forest, okay? Stop logging in old growth forest. Just don't do it, all right? Let's log in other forests, all right? Stop clear cutting on steep slopes because that increases erosion. So look, clear cutting is terrible, but if you have to do it, don't do it on steep slopes where you're going to increase the rate of erosion. At least do it on, on, on flat slopes. Reduce road building in forest and rely more on selective and strip cutting. Again, so selective would be your number one way. Strip cutting, which is just taking clear cutting in strips would be the number two way. Uh, and then obviously a distant third is your, is, your, is your clear cutting on at least flat surfaces, all right? So again, try to be more, rely more on selective, uh, selective cutting and reduce that road building because once you start building roads, you start fragmenting and degrading that forest. Leave most standing dead trees and larger fallen trees for wildlife habitat and nutrient cycling. So don't take them out of the forest, leave them in there. Put tree plantations only on deforested and degraded land. So again, don't take a beautiful old growth forest, cut it down, and then put in all those palm trees uh, for palm tree oil. 
Go out and find something that has already been deforested or degraded and then plant your tree plantations on that land already. So at least you're not uh, you're not making the land worse. If anything, you're making it a little better, right? Because if you have degraded land and then you put more trees on it, if they're the same type of tree, it's better than having nothing, all right? But it's much worse than having a nice old growth forest. And certified timber grown by sustainable methods. So again, if people follow okay, these, these, uh, these steps, then we should actually have a, a timber certification that says sustainable. And we should only buy from companies that harvest timber in a sustainable way. All right. If you don't see that certification, you shouldn't buy that product. So that's something that that we could do as well. Just another part, another potential solution uh, for more sustainable forestry. All right. So, again, we're going to need to cut down some trees here or there. But if we do it in this way, all right, we can help slow down the uh, the degradation of our forest. All right, we also need to improve the management of forest fires. So the U.S. Smokey the Bear educational campaign, pros and cons of fires. I don't know if you guys are aware of Smokey the Bear. Only you can prevent forest fires. I don't know if you ever seen that commercial when I was your age back in the 80s. Uh, that, was a, that was a pretty big thing. And actually, uh, there's a road that uh, leaves, leaves out of my hometown over in New Jersey called Skyline Drive. Uh, Ringwood is my hometown in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, right over here about 20 minutes away. But Skyline Drive uh, goes over Ringwood and up into Oakland um, and out onto Route 287. Well, there's actually a little Smokey the Bear guy at the top of, of Skyline Drive. I remember when I was a kid driving over and it always had your he had the forest fire danger and it was green, meaning no danger for forest fires, all the way up to red, meaning high danger. So again, just an educational campaign. All right. Uh, do prescribed burn. So this is what I talked about. All right, I actually spoke about this already. Remove flammable material and underbrush, all right? So actually have controlled surface fires that remove that flammable material so that hopefully if a, if a bigger fire does erupt, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't spread as rapidly. And allow fires on public land to burn as long as structures aren't threatened. Again, um, you know, look, we don't want super crown fires, but some uh, smaller type of fires uh, on public land, not the end of the world, as again, uh, it does uh, replenish the soil uh, and allow for, uh, for new trees and, and, and for new uh, for new biodiversity. Uh, protect structures in prior uh, fire-prone areas, so thin nearby trees and vegetation, eliminate use of highly flammable construction materials, and use drones with infrared sensors to detect fires and monitor progress in fighting them. All right, just in the last five years, obviously, drones uh, have become a big part uh, of what we do in, uh, in environmental science. And again, we can use these drones uh, to help detect fires that maybe be occurring uh, in forest areas that we can't get to. Guess what? Let's not cut a, a road in there. Let's use a drone uh, to help detect the fires and, 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 and to monitor them uh, and to monitor the progress of those fires. In addition, we need to reduce the demand for harvested trees, uh, so improve the efficiency of wood use. All right, 60% of the U.S. wood use is wasted. That's silly, all right? So let's improve the efficiency, and then we obviously would need less wood. Or make tree-free paper, so something called a uh, kanaf, rice straw, hemp, all right, uh, could be used to make paper, uh, and therefore... Uh, we don't need the trees and, and reduce the use of throwaway paper products as well. All right. So here is actually Kanaf. It's a, a fast growing plant uh, and it can be used for paper. It's very fast growing. Uh, it doesn't take 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, and again, you can uh, you can use this uh, as, as an idea uh, to to create paper. Uh, and therefore, we don't have to keep uh, cutting down our forest and, and deforesting uh, our earth here. All right. Uh, reducing trauma tropical deforestation and get uh, some other just again just more ideas guys on how we can uh can halt the uh, deforestation of our forests. Uh, debt for nature swaps and conservation concession, concessions. So again, protect forests in return for aid. So we talked about how a lot of the tropical deforestation occurring in those third world countries. Well, maybe as a first world country, we go in and say, all right, look, uh, we're going to give you aid money, but in return for that money, 
you need to protect some of your forest. Okay, so kind of a give and take type of thing there uh, to help uh, to help countries. They obviously they're cutting down forests because they need money, right? They need agriculture. They need uh, they need their their uh, their their cattle and their sheep to be able to graze to make money. So the whole point is money, all right? Third world countries again they they have, they have a they need to be able to uh, supply uh, provide for their citizens just like we in the United States do. So maybe this is the nice kind of uh, a concession. We'll give you money, all right, that you would have maybe made by tropi- uh, cutting down those tropical forests. We'll give you the money, and in return, uh, you protect the forest. Crack down on illegal logging. Obviously, that's kind of self-explanatory. Again, end government subsidies for logging roads. Okay, these logging roads are the beginning of the end. All right, Pur- uh, purchase only sustainable produced wood. We talked about that. Uh, same things go for the uh, the northern forest as go for the tropical forest. And once again, plant forest on degraded land. Uh, if you see land that is degraded, uh, definitely uh, plant some more forest. So again, just more solutions, sustaining tropical forests. Just go through these. Just have a couple in your mind. Uh, um, prevention. All right, protect the most diverse and endangered areas, educate settlers about sustainable agricultural and forestry, subsidize only sustainable forest use, protect forests through those depth for nature swaps, certify, again, sustainably grown timber, reduce poverty and slow population growth uh, can obviously help as well. Restoration, encourage regrowth through secondary succession, okay? Rehabilitate degraded areas and concentrate farming and ranching in areas already cleared. Okay, don't clear them. Find areas that are clear and then concentrate your farming and ranching in those areas. Okay, so that's uh, that's it on forest. All right, that's part one of three of this lecture on chapter 10. Uh, we will come back and uh, move into how can we manage and sustain grasslands. All right, so more on that coming up in the next part.